Moving on to our, our next session, which I, uh, I'm uh, very much looking forward to. Uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, former Representative Henry Waxman. Uh, Congressman Henry Waxman, Waxman is one of the most influential and prolific health lawmakers ever to serve in the House of Representatives, sponsored key legislation on a range of health and environmental issues during his, his four decades in Congress. Uh, when, uh, uh, when Representative Waxman announced his retirement in January of 2004, President Obama described the congressman as one of the most accomplished legislators of his or any era. Among his many accomplishments, uh, Waxman was deeply involved in public health policy on vaccine research, funding, and distribution. He authored the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986, which established a vaccine adverse event reporting system and created a no-fault compensation system for vaccine-related issues. We've been seeing a lot in the press lately uh, with politicians weighing in on their perspective around measles vaccination. Uh, please welcome uh, Representative Waxman on the politics of vaccines. Thank you very much, Dr. Besser, and I appreciate this chance to join this forum today, and I compliment the uh, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, the Bloomberg School of Public Health for hosting this event. Uh, this is a teachable moment for this country when we see a, d a disease that was almost completely eliminated uh, in the early 1980s now come back with a jolt all around this country. We have to ask ourselves what is going on? Why are we experiencing this uh, serious problem? Vaccinations are the most effective public health interventions in the world. They save millions of lives each year. This is a, uh, a revolution in public health when we have had uh, vaccines developed that can prevent terrible, serious, often deadly illnesses. Vaccines can make you immune to smallpox, immune to polio, and immune to measles but no vaccine can make you immune to politics. Not even vaccines are immune to politics. And that's what I want to discuss, because during my 40 years in Congress, I've seen politics threaten vaccination efforts time and time again. The threats have been in several categories. Uh, one, whether we were going to have budget policies and oversight policies, that would be keeping faith with science. And every time an ideology propped up to threaten the immunization programs in this nation, what we had, fortunately, was uh, enough, enough reasonable people, Democrats and Republicans, who were able to put the needs of our children and their health above ideology and partisanship. Now, we've been hearing today, uh, in the last few weeks, reports about uh, the politicization of this issue. And people point to comments made by Senator Rand Paul or Governor Christie, uh, comments that I think are irresponsible. And I think they realize now we're irresponsible when they talked about getting immunized as a matter of personal choice. Uh, Senator Paul is a libertarian. He thinks this is a personal matter. But the, the point of the vaccine is not just to protect your own child, and therefore maybe you can decide whether you want your child protected, but it's to protect the public. It's to protect other children it's a, a matter of not just personal responsibility, but civic responsibility to uh, make sure that uh, contagious diseases are not spread. Uh, when you have a matter that threatens the public, government has an essential role to play. This is not a partisan issue. I know a lot of people think perhaps it's partisan because they look at Republicans uh, taking the role of denying, denying science when it comes to climate change and evolution and other basic scientific facts. Some Republicans have a problem 
dealing with a consensus of scientific evidence when some of their constituents who are conservative because of their distrust of government or their feeling that maybe science is just as valid as any other personal opinion, uh, look at it from a perspective that uh, we need to ac ac accept the fact that science is based on examining evidence. It's not a personal opinion that's being expressed. It's opinion based on evaluation of the evidence which lead to rejection or acceptance of different hypotheses. But this is not a partisan matter, and there has been broad bipartisan support for immunizations. And I want to point out previous occasions where politics has come up over the question of immunizations. For the most part, the uh, issues at the federal level have been to remove barriers to getting a vaccine. So in the 1980s, President Reagan proposed cutting the vaccine program. The federal vaccine program was to give money to the states for public health purposes, and money that was to be used for uh, uh, immunizations, and he proposed a cut in the 317 program because he was looking at it as part of his overall budget. Well, we had he held hearings on this issue and the consequences that it could lead to, and we heard from doctors who were warning us at that time about measles outbreaks and other outbreaks of diseases that were completely preventable. Congress wound up rejecting these proposed budget cuts, and I was joined by my colleagues, Democrat and Republican, who worried about the impact of public health. So the um, uh, vaccine, vaccination cuts that were being proposed were rejected. But the funding was never as adequate as it needed to be. And the weakness of our funding system became evident to us in the early 1990s when we had another outbreak of measles as we're seeing today. It was a horrible outbreak. And people realized that measles is very contagious and that, that measles could be prevented by immunizations. So we uh, use that moment to try to say that we've got to assure that we have enough vaccines for people. But one of the problems we are facing at that, not, at that time was that many of the drug companies were concerned about uh, making vaccines and finding that it wasn't profitable to them because of the fear of product liability. And so we had dwindling numbers of manufacturers willing to make vaccines. Well, at one point, we only had one manufacturer making uh, some of these vaccines. And when we have one manufacturer making a vaccine, uh, the prices go up, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, shortages occur if there were any disruption in their manufacturing processes. And we were finding a great deal of fear that we wouldn't have enough supply of vaccines. Well, we looked at the problem and we said what we needed to do was to assure the vaccine manufacturers that these rare, very extremely rare cases where they might be held to liability could be dealt with in another way. We didn't want to say that people couldn't go to court. There are values in being able to go to court because our tort system makes uh, the safety of uh, products more secure. But we came up with was a no-fault system, an immunization, a, a, pro, a, a program that would uh, compensate those cases uh, if, if they were related to vaccines without having to prove the relationship directly, but if some rare episodes occur with some vaccines, we would, we would provide compensation uh, to those who are injured. But we would still allow them to sue if they chose to. But most, for the most part, 
There was no choice to sue once the, the child and the family were going to be compensated. Um, we had ideological problems. We had political problems. There was a fellow named John Bolton, who we often hear about in the context of foreign policy, but he was an assistant attorney general in the administration, and he said that we should oppose this vaccine compensation system. He said, one, well, it's not clear that there's any real federal reason to get involved. Secondly, he said that it's gonna to lead to um, more involvement of the Justice Department in uh, compensation efforts. And lastly, he said, this is gonna create a new tax because the vaccine, vaccine compensation fund was going to uh, be uh, uh, provided the funds necessary through a small tax on the sale of every vaccine. Well, that was his view, but it wasn't the view of the Department of Health. It wasn't the view of the President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, and we were able to get to the vaccine compensation system uh, as, as a, a bipartisan matter. And it helped increase the number of uh, manufacturers who are now available uh, to make these vaccines. We, we got a compromise. Another issue that came up was when President Clinton came to office. And President Clinton said, what we needed to do was to assure a supply that every child will be able to be immunized. And the federal government ought to take over that responsibility. Well, there were objections to that because one, a lot of people were getting the immunizations through the private system, and why should the federal government take over the whole business of vaccines? But we heard arguments such as, why should the federal government pay for immunizations if the parents can afford to pay for it? Well, that's an argument we hear often, but if you think about it in other contexts, it shows how wrong that evaluation is. We don't look to see whether a child comes from a home where the parents may be able to afford private education if they are going to go to public schools. We say there ought to be public schools. It's a public matter. If people choose to have a private school education, that's their choice, but we need to provide public education for all children. The compromise that was reached on a bipartisan basis was to say, we'll let the private vaccine uh, system continue on. People can get vaccines through their private insurance coverage. But for everybody else, for all children, we would guarantee that immunization supplies would be available to them. Uh, it would be done through the Medicaid program, it would be done through the, through the uh, clinics. It would be done through the local supply uh, system. And uh, the US government would provide complete 100% funding where uh, there was going to be mandatory spending for vaccines administered through the community health centers, the public health departments, or Medicaid. Uh, over time, uh, governors, Democrats and Republicans came to support a 100% federally funded vaccine financing program. So we had, uh, we had a compromise. We had politics, people raised problems, but we worked through them. Uh, but we uh, had a worse problem in the Congress of the United States when uh, Chairman Dan Burton who chaired the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, decided to hold a series of hearings focusing on vaccine safety. Because he was so highly ideological and so much against government that he was uh, determined to try to destroy people's faith in the immunization system. He had hearings, multiple hearings, and he brought in a star witness, Dr. Andrew Wakefield, whose research on me measles vaccine had caused such a scare in the United Kingdom 
that measles outbreaks were occurring once again. Dr. Wakefield was the one, as we heard earlier today, who argued that immunizations, immunizations cause autism. Now this came at a time when there were rising cases of autism. Parents were certainly very fearful, justifiably so, that their children might become autistic. And when we had a congressman holding hearings to promote that point of view, it was like, it was like uh, igniting a match. And that stuck with a lot of people until, what is it, a lie goes around the world a number of times before the truth catches on with it. That uh, caused a lot of parents around the country to decide that they were not going to get their kids immunized. Uh, certainly the Congress was playing, especially Congressman Burton, with matches. And even when we brought in the Institute of Medicine and the Center for Disease Control and all the scientific consensus that there was no connection whatsoever between immunizations and autism, he continued to repeat that lie over and over again. And in fact, I noticed in this last week that Chairman Burton was inter interviewed on CNN, where he again restated that immunizations cause autism. And he uh, was relying on a study that was completely and utterly discredited. Propagating, uh, propagating falsehoods about vaccines can have consequences, and we are now seeing those consequences. When it comes to the politics of whether immunizations are going to be mandated or whether there can be excuses for uh, parents not to immunize those, their children, that has not been at the federal level, it's been at the local level. And I agreed with Dr. Sharfstein when he said it should stay at the local level because the politics at the local level is to convince parents and the community that they must immunize their children. Uh, in my own state of California, in my own former congressional district of Santa Monica, uh, there have been a large number of affluent people who did not get their children immunized because they had the ability to say they had a personal belief, not a religious belief, not a medical belief, but a personal belief. And this personal belief for many of them was exercised because they forgot what it was like. They never heard what it was like to have a measles outbreak. And therefore, they didn't bother to immunize their children, whether it was out of a personal belief or just plain laziness uh, or fear. Uh, they had this belief and used it to not get their children immunized. Uh, my own state now is changing the law. Other states are going to change their laws. And I don't think it ought to be to say no reason should allow a parent's decision to trump the requirement for immunizations, because ultimately what we need to do is convince the parents that it's in their children's best interest to have them immunized. Well, my point to you from what I've seen over the years is that Democrats and Republicans have not only restored funding, we supported research into new groundbreaking vaccines, we had a a uh, sensible policy of vaccine liability and vaccine financing. We supported through investigation uh, uh, of these allegations that there were no vaccine safety problems. There was no connection between immunizations and autism and other medical problems. We've done it on a bipartisan basis. But uh, we shouldn't lose our cool when one politician says something inappropriate about vaccines. There are consequences when people do that. They shouldn't be ignored, but there has to be a continuation of the bipartisan center that recognizes the value of the public health's greatest achievements through immunizations. Through this conference today,
through the terrible news that we're hearing about, uh, even more alarming as new results have been announced by the CDC just today, let us recognize that we have responsibilities to learn and to impress upon families that immunizations are a blessing. And it's a blessing, however, only if children do get immunized and parents have the responsibility, as do their communities, for the, their own children and others that the immunizations take place. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. Oh, sure. Uh, thanks very much for that. I'll, I'll let you on this side <laughs> okay. with, with the mic. Yeah. Um, but uh, a, a couple questions for you. One, one is uh, the, the current Congress has been described as one of the most divisive Congresses ever. Um, do you have any worries that that divisiveness would threaten the partnership that you've described here that's existed around, around vaccination? Well, I, I always have worries about that. Uh, and I've, I've seen in recent years an increase in what we call science deniers, people who refuse to recognize science as, the, as a, based on evidence and reaching conclusions from the evidence. And I see more and more when you talk about climate change or these other matters that I mentioned earlier, uh, that, that people dismiss the science if their ideology uh, wants, uh, indicates that they, uh, they uh, can't otherwise deal with the conclusions from the science. So I worry about it. But we have not seen this yet in immunizations except from a few irresponsible comments by a few uh, politicians. Um, I worry about it, but let's keep our heads about us and recognize that politics has intervened in the past, but we've overcome the politics by good, hard, common sense and looking at the medical judgments of those who have done the studies and could give us their learned opinions. You, you, you mentioned the, the issue of science denying. Mm -hmm. um, uh, many look to climate change as the big issue where you'll see a, a a, a minority, but a, a segment of the conservative community that denies the, the science around climate change and, and distrust government. Um, on the other hand, when you look at vaccines and, and the issue there of, of science denial and distrust of government, uh, many of those who are denying it on that side are highly educated, your community in Santa Monica, mm -hmm. do you see, liberals. Do you yeah. see a parallel between the the two issues and, and science denying, one and issue that resonates very strongly with the conservative community and one that is resonate, resonating very strongly with, with a, a more liberal community? I, I, um, I think we have to recognize the science denial by the, by the conservatives because they are being, it's being driven by a financial interest for the uh, carbon-based fuels the coal industry, the oil industry, uh, the Koch brothers uh, who uh, want to support candidates who will deny the science. And they advertise that the whole idea of climate change is a hoax. But they're wrong. And, uh, but it's being driven by not just ideology, but financial gain for those who stand to benefit from this uh, science deny denying. On the vaccine side, we have some conservatives and some liberals who are interjecting their points of, uh, of view. But I think that uh, without the financial backing of those who would stand to benefit, because who benefits? The healthcare system that's going to give care to people with measles? There's no financial benefit to deny, denying the, 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 the um, reality of how immunizations protect public health. I, I think that we can see that um, it's a different situation and that, um, and that people are going to have to be educated. We have to recognize there are science deniers on the left as well as the right. There was an interesting article the other day in the, uh, in the newspaper where someone said, my liberal friends, uh, are, look down their nose at those who reject the science of climate change, yet if they're making motion pictures or 
video games that can influence children and give them uh, a sense that violence is acceptable, aren't they denying the science as well? So it, being ignorant can be uh, a, a, a consequence of people who are misinformed, whether they're on the left or the right, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. And I think we have to not let this be partisan, and there's no reason it should be partisan. You talked about the Vaccine uh, Compensation Act and yeah. its ability to, to bring more businesses in to, to create more vaccines. Um, I've heard, had, had people who worry about vaccines point to that system as evidence that vaccines are inherently dangerous, that we wouldn't need this system mm -hmm. uh, to compensate people if, if, if vaccines were safe. How do you, how yeah. do you balance yeah. the, 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 those, those two perspectives? The uh, reason the vaccine compensation system was developed is not because there are many cases, but because there are few rare cases where uh, there's a, um, a, 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 re a, a, an adverse reaction that is often quite horrible. And those cases are indeed rare. So the vaccine manufacturers worry about the liability and the lawsuits from those people. If they, uh, that's, uh, rather than have them subject to uh, enormous amounts of money to, to go into litigation, we said, let's compensate these people. But it is extremely rare, and the best evidence of how rare it is is that we set up a compensation system with a tax on the vaccine that ran a surplus. Uh, when, young, when we had a ad, rare re adverse reaction, there was a compensation given without all the, the, the um, efforts that a, a lawsuit would have to mean for the person to be compensated or the drug company to defend against it. A and when the compensation was given, the compensation was accepted almost always instead of going into the court. But it's not because it was a common problem, it was because it was a rare problem that was threatening uh, the, the uh, manufacturers into thinking that maybe they ought to stay out of this particular line of, uh, of, of medical uh, production. And just one, one last question. Mm -hmm. With such a, a long career in, in, in Congress, when you look back on, on your legacy around, around health, um, what are you proudest of? Well, I'm proud of many uh, things that I've done in the health and the environmental and other areas, and I wouldn't want to single out any particular uh, one issue. But I would say that I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud that we were able to show that government is important in the lives of the American people, and we take for granted things that we have to recognize that were often hard fights in Congress. We take for granted, for example, that uh, we can read the uh, information on the labels of products to know uh, the nutrition so we can handle our own diets. People would say, of course. But that came about over many years. We fought the tobacco companies and got legislation to give FDA authority to regulate them. That was 14 years later than when the CEOs testified and lied about cigarettes causing disease. Uh, we uh, had um, uh, other common sense bills almost always uh, took time to deal with the HIV AIDS epidemic uh, to develop the response from the Ryan White Act. All of those bills were bipartisan except one and that was the Affordable Care Act and it shouldn't have been partisan except for the fact in my view that the Republicans who had, who had given the original ideas for the creation of this way of dealing with the health care uh, insurance problem decided that they weren't going to give President Obama any chance for any victory. But otherwise, uh, all the bills that I've been involved in have been helpful, important in people's lives, whether it's immunizations or disease screening or dealing with uh, various diseases, uh, they're important, but they were not easy. And we have to keep that perspective in mind uh, to uh, understand the legislative process uh, moves slowly, but when it accomplishes important goals, it is very, very important for the, uh, for the American people. Thanks very much. Thank you.